Welcome out to the Trading Justice Podcast. I got an absolutely special and amazing guest here today uh, on the podcast. This is kind of a bucket list item for me, and, and he needs absolutely no introduction to our community. But Jack, I'm still going to give you a little bit of a bio just so uh, people can get to know you a little bit. Jack Schwager is one of the most recognized industry experts in, in futures and hedge funds and an author of many, many, many books, including the first book I ever read as a trader, The New Market Wizards, and, and obviously the, the rest of the series of The New Market Wizards as well. He's one of the founders of FunSeeder, a platform designed to find undiscovered trading talent worldwide and connect unknown successful traders with sources of investment capital. He was, he was a partner in the Fortune Group, which was a London-based hedge fund advisory firm, and his experience in the market is 22 years of directors of futures and research and you know, decades now as, as a Wall Street expert. Jack Schwager, how are you doing? It's such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. I'm great, thanks. Jack, let's get right into it here with uh, kind of the, the conversation piece. And, the, you know, Jack, as I was preparing for this interview, the, the one thing that really kind of stood out to me before I even got into anything, and it's something I, can, I kind of geek out on, is you've had such a long and successful journey as a, as a, as a writer, as an author, as a trader, as, an, as a market participant. But before all of that, Jack, how'd you get interested in the markets from, from the very beginning? By accident. Uh, <laughs> truly, by accident. I was out of uh, graduate school of a uh, uh, degree in economics, and I was just looking mm -hmm. for an interesting job. And I got an interview for a research position in the uh, Futures uh, Department of what was then called Reynolds Securities, mm -hmm. a firm that has long been merged into to non-existence. But uh, that was the, I knew nothing about, in fact, I was so ignorant. I still, I still cringe at my answer. I got the job anyway. Uh, I'll tell you why. But my first interview for that job, uh, the fellow who was the research director was named Erwin Shisko. He wrote a column for Barron's on mm -hmm. I think the Futures Corner or something like that. Anyway, so he asked me, well, like, you know, what do you know about commodities? And I didn't know any of Back in those days, forget about commodities or futures. I mean, they didn't even teach, you know, uh, an equity. Really? I mean, and, you know, those in economics, you just those areas weren't touched. There were no. Yeah. So I, I knew virtually nothing. I said, my answer, like I say, my answer was so bad. I still remember it. I said, well, something like gold, you know, and well, I guess it's technically correct, but uh, <laughs> I got the job anyway because uh, luckily for me, he was doing this column as I mentioned, and the way he got, he did the research or picked to read the. Uh, the person who would take the job is he got it down to four people of which I was one. Mm -hmm. And he asked us to, uh, he gave each one an assignment on a different commodity. I got assigned copper. And the assignment was to write an analytical piece on it for, that he would then use his first column as he does research, you know, the base of the research. So I spent, and this is pre, this is way pre internet. So yeah. uh, at the time I was a Brooklyn. Was this in the early eighties, Jack? What's that? Was this in the early 80s? This was, no, this was literally 1971. So we're way before any computer. Oh, we're talking before even gold was introduced into the futures market. Well, gold, yeah, that's true. Uh, gold, gold came on. I mean, I don't know if they had gold. You couldn't really, I think it was 72, 72. It was pretty close. Yeah. So this is real. Uh, certainly before financial uh, futures, before stock index, before currency futures. It was really, it was really traditionally commodities then. Yeah. Uh, so I went to the, the Brooklyn, uh, what is it, uh, Grand Army Plaza, which is a big library in Brooklyn. And I literally lived there for a week, and I read everything I could on, on copper. And I wrote, and I wrote this piece up. And you know, I remember about ten to fifteen years later finding it as one of my papers that I filed away, and I read it. And considering for somebody I didn't, I didn't know anything, it was actually pretty good. So yeah. that got passed around, and people, you know, when they passed around the he passed around the four applicants. And that's how I got, my, so I basically wrote my way into the job. And, but I knew nothing about markets. I had no particular interest in markets. And that's how I landed there. You know, it, so it, I was it, in there. I said, gee, this is kind of interesting, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's no textbook for it. There's no way of particularly doing things. Uh, the research out there wasn't very good. Uh, so I thought, well, this is, I could be a, I could be a medium-sized fish in a, 
you know, in a small pond or something like that. I like it. I like it. You know, you, you mentioned your first writing was that analytical piece on copper. You know, the first book you, you wrote was the 1984 Futures book, correct? Right, right. And, uh, it was called The Complete Guide to the Futures Mark. And that was an analytical writing as well, correct? Totally, totally. And then I, that was redone in the second edition about a year or a year and a half ago. And I, I do have a question on that because, it, it, you know, your, your New Market series books, I mean, what do you have, a five different editions of the uh, New Market? Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, there are four, four of the traditional, you know, format ones. And then uh -huh. I did one which just took the key ideas. And it's part of this little book series that John Wiley has. Mm -hmm. So it's a little book of market wizards. But there are yeah. four of the traditional format ones. Yeah. The question I have for you on that one, because... When you're looking at that analytical piece in the complete guide to futures, and then you fast forward five years to your first edition of the new market wizard, we're talking two completely different philosophical approaches to, to writing, correct? I mean, totally. I'm glad you, you noticed that. Yeah. What, 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 what possessed you to a certain extent to kind of make the modification from the analytical approach to more of the mindset approach? Well, it's different. It's different hats. It's different uh, skills. Um, I did the analytical book because this sounds a bit, I don't know how you say this without sounding egotistical, but I really did it because I didn't think there was a good book out there, mm -hmm. Futures Market Analysis. And I thought I could do the best book. So I was really setting, and I, and when I did that book, I wasn't concerned about sales at all. I just wanted to write the best book. And I did things which I knew would decrease sales. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I had a, a whole big section on, on statistics and regression analysis. Uh, I mean, I know that sales of a book are inversely correlated to the number yeah. of patients. So I knew that that was not going to, it was a tremendous amount of work. We're talking pre -P, way pre PC, you know, so this is, you know, literally doing multiple regressions by hand. So it was a tremendous amount of work to do, but I just wanted to do the best book. That was my only you know, best analytical book. Mm -hmm. uh, but the next book, I didn't want to do that again. My next book, I wanted to reach a more broad audience because I, I liked writing, just writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew that analytical book served a purpose, but it wasn't that. So the Marco Wizards idea I had, and eventually I had an author who wanted me to do another analytical, uh, not an author, a publisher, that wanted me to do another analytical book and I, actually a series of analytical books. I said, no, thanks. Mm -hmm. I said, but here's an idea I have. And, uh, and so that's, that was the catalyst to... The market wizards. Well, you know, I, I, I truly do believe that. And, and I like both styles, the analytical approach versus the mindset approach and whatnot. But, you know, Jack, I've been an educator in the financial world for, you know, a decade now. And, you know, what I have found, because I have an analytical mindset, that's kind of the way my mindset works. But what I've found is you can reach a greater percentage of your audience with more mindset because they understand it a little bit more than the analytical approach. I, I, I'm willing to bet if you gave you know, the, the complete guide to the futures market to a very, very, very new trader, they would probably be a little overwhelmed with it in comparison to the new market wizards. I mean, certainly. And for, it depends on the application. If it's strictly for the skill of trading, the market wizards books would be more apropos. Uh, if, it's, if it's for devising methodologies, uh, whether it's technical or fundamental, mm -hmm. then the, the analytical book gives you more kind of tools. Uh, Absolutely and so forth. And also, one of the very important things I did when I wrote the analytical book, my guideline was, even though I had some stuff in there that was, you know, equations, my guideline was if you were, if you knew high school math, you could do the book. You didn't need more than high school math. Yeah. So nothing in that book, you know, rarely if I had anything like, uh, like something that preferred to a proof or something like that, I, that was calculus oriented, I throw it in a footnote. So in the main text, there's really, even though it has statistics and, and all sorts of stuff, it's all written from a framework. And in fact, one of the big problems I had was I, I thought I was gonna do one chapter on regression mm -hmm. analysis, and I found every word I wanted, every next word I wanted to use, I couldn't assume people understood what it meant. So yeah. then I had to write a chapter on, preliminary chapter on understanding basic statistics, you know, and so, and then I have to do simple aggression before I go to multiple. And so I build it chapter by chapter. So you literally could get through that book and understand it if you're willing to do the work and know nothing more than, that, than high school math. You know, fast forwarding into the new market wizards, 
what gave you the idea to interview these great traders? What, what, what started that process? I knew some of them. So, uh, by so you were friends with some. Yeah, well, I, I, the, my first job that I mentioned, the, the person vacating that position was Michael Marcus, who was chairman, really? you know, in, in Market Wizards. Uh, and so I knew him. I also, via him, I, I actually, I, thought I also had worked, uh, he had hired me to be working with Commodities Corporation. So I also knew some of the people at Commodities Corporation, like Bruce Governor. And, uh, and so I just had a head start mm -hmm. with knowing a couple of sort of like the best traders, you know, that, of that generation. And I also thought this would be a neat idea to go around the country and pick the minds of great traders as a theme for a book. So I thought it'd be a, it was like a fun project to do. So I had the idea, but I, for full time, by that point, I was a director of research. Mm -hmm. So I had a staff and, you know, more than, it's more, it was more than a full-time job. So there really was no time, but um, I didn't want to do the book. And when I had a publisher say, why don't you do that? Since I wanted to do it already, I agreed to do it. And back in those days, particularly, I was very, very good at focusing. And so I could literally stay up uh, doing all-nighter and mm -hmm. get a lot done. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't attempt to do it that way now, but back then I could. When you, when you initially got the conception for the book, eventually after it was released and it became such a wide success and a widely, it, it was a hit. Did you expect it to be that successful? No, I didn't. Re yes and no. Okay, I didn't know it was going to be successful, but my goal when I wrote it, and I, I keep on, every time I get a question like that, I always forget to go back and see if I mentioned it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, when I know, I know when I wrote the original Market Wizards book, at that time I had read Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. And at that time, that was 65 years after the fact. Mm -hmm. I was struck by how, even though this book was kind of archaic, talking, you know, taking place in the era of bucket shops and yeah. that type of stuff, that it's, there was still a, some, a lot of quotes in there that really resonated with what I had seen about trading. And it still was true 65 years later. So I did have, and that was kind of a classic, you know, obviously I was reading it 65, 65 years after publication. Mm -hmm. So it was by definition a classic. And I did have the goal that I want to do a modern day book that hopefully 65 years from when I wrote it, people would still be reading it. So that was my, that, that was my goal. Now, I, that doesn't mean I expected it to be, to come true, but that's what I was shooting. Well, I, I, I would say you achieved that goal, Jack, because okay. I mean, I got, if, <laughs> if you ask any trader, their top three books, top five books, however you want to rank them, New Market Wizards and Reminiscence are going to be right yeah. up there. It's 30 years later, that original book is still, you know, still kind oh, it's, of, it, yeah, I mean, I, I have so, the original version and I, I still read it. It's an amazing well, I think, book. I think, you know, when it gets to 65 years, it'll still be there. I think, I think it will as well. You know, in terms of the interviews that you conducted for the New Market Wizards, there were so many, I mean, the 80s was just chock full of all of these great traders with different systems, different approaches to the marketplaces. How did you go about selecting the, the individuals that eventually became part of those interviews for the book? So I was basically looking for the spectacular story. Uh, mm -hmm. so take some, you know, like it was, Michael Marks, I mentioned, you know, they give him, a, he goes to commodity school, they give him a $30,000 account, and a dozen years later, he's turned it into 80 million. And that's what they're taking money out of it. Or Bruce Kovner, who, when I interviewed him at the time, I think had something approaching 10 years with an 80% compounded return. And you can't keep that up, of course, but still, yeah. just, you know, stupendous achievements. I was looking for, the spectacular story. Uh, I was also, I mean, in terms of achievement, but ultimately also needed people who, who would give me good material. So, um, I mean, if, if I had a trader who did well, but, you know, if you, if, if, if you interview them, just, there was just nothing, just nothing mm -hmm. came out of it, then it's very difficult to, to turn that into uh, an interview. So I also needed people who had interesting anecdotes and stories and would also be willing to say enough so you could 
pull out lessons from it. Now, mm-hmm. they didn't, some people actually were surprisingly open in how much they did say, and some people were more close to the vest, but still said enough so you can draw some lessons out of it. So, but I needed yeah. that. I, I, was, I was thinking about that in terms of getting these great successful individuals to, to talk openly about their success, their systems. A lot of traders are so closed and, and so closed off and so close to the vest that they have a hard time opening up about the, their process, their philosophy, their take on the market, their trading systems and whatnot. Was it difficult to get a lot of them to be as open as they eventually became? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I can think of interviews, uh, but one that comes to mind immediately, and this is in, this is Bill Lipschitz, the currency trader, who, mm-hmm. you know, ex-Solomon, uh, and now, and Hather Sage is over him for decades. Now, Lipschitz, I remember going to his apartment and uh, for a few hours interviewing him, and I just wasn't getting anything, you know, just, you know, you could tell, in other words, when I'm doing an interview, I, I'm, even then I could tell. Now, of course, I could tell. But you, you can almost see it on the page. You know, when somebody says mm-hmm. stuff, you know when it's good. And when there's nothing there, you kind of know it too, unfortunately. And for the first few hours, I wasn't getting anything. I mean, and then we, then we stopped for, you know, and we go to Chinese food or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then, the, you know, the quota started off. And then he starts talking. You know? So I thought, but it, it, and, and so then I continued for multiple hours after that. I went back a second or third time. Ultimately, I got enough material, but it doesn't, sometimes it takes quite a few hours before you get the first thing you can literally use. And so part of it is the time, you need to take more time. And the other part, the other thing is that helped me, from the beginning, what I did is I told traders that I'll, I'll let you see what I write before it's published. Because mm-hmm. I didn't want them, and I don't, I didn't do that because I'm a you know, great guy. I don't want to, I mean, it's fair, but I also wanted them to know that, hey, that they don't have to kind of mentally censor themselves constantly because, hey, I say this is going to be in a book and so forth. So I wanted them to know that they could intercept that, that if something was not right, or they said something they really didn't want, that I gave them, you know, my, I gave them my word that I would let them see it and approve it before it got published. And usually there were virtually no changes ever. And, but once in a while, you know, uh, somebody would you know, say, well, this is not quite right. And we would find some way to, to make this sentence work or whatever. And, mm-hmm. uh, and there, were a few, there were a few instances where I ended up not being able to use the interview, which had nothing to do with what I wrote, but had to do with other circumstances. Mm-hmm. So it, in, in those cases, I guess, worked against me, but it was worth it because I think it led people to be much more open than they would have been had I not made that the end guarantee. And well, sometimes can, they literally had me sign an agreement saying that I would, you know, not yeah. use it. Fully. Well, I mean, I, I just think that's wise philosophy in the first place. I mean, especially as you start writing more books and more books and more books, there's a trust with that transparency. And so I think it's very, very intelligent to, to make sure, maybe not that they have, you know, the sign off on everything, but give them a heads up, say, hey, listen, this is in the book. And if you're not comfortable with something, because you went into a lot of personal stories in, in the book as well, in terms of how they approach certain things. You know, in terms of all the people you interviewed for that book, I'm sure there was people who said no, right? That just did, did not want to do the interview. What was that one trader that got away from you that you just wanted to interview? Well, the, the, two, the two most prominent traders I can think of, in one case I spoke to directly, which was Jim Simons of uh, Renaissance, mm-hmm. who probably has as good a track record as ever in return risk terms as has ever been compiled. It would have been, I wasn't heartbroken with that. Actually, he, I asked him on two different, two different books. You know, the first time I got to no, know, the second time I went back, and he at least thought about it for a week and then said no. Uh, I wasn't exactly heartbroken because I knew it'd be a very, very difficult interview. Mm-hmm. Sort of like with D.E. Sharp, you know, who was also extremely secretive, and that was also difficult, but he had at least agreed. Uh, so Simons was one, and the other one I never could actually get to speak to because I never got past his circle of people, and that's George Soros. So if you ask me who's, you know, the people who should have been in those books that weren't, those are the two names that pop up most prominently. You know, George Soros is one of those traders that 
you know, people have different opinions of George Soros, but I've always felt like George Soros was one of the greatest traders of all time. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, everything I know about him, he is. And, uh, uh, and like, one removed from, from George Soros is Stanley Druckermiller, who I did interview, and who did run Soros' funds for, for a number of years. Well, while Soros was in Eastern Europe, post-Berlin Wall coming down. Kind of opening uh, up the and, you know, capital markets right there. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. tried to get capitalism going and everything else. And uh, it's odd that he gets attacked now for being the leftist where, where he was really a complete market person. I think he's, he's, he's a capitalist. He's a free market guy. You know, yeah, he's a free market guy. So terms have gotten really flipped around these days. Um, but in any case, uh, that's where he was. And, Soros, and Druckenmiller was running his funds. But Druckenmiller learned, you know, Acknowledge a lot to, that he what he learned from Soros, and and of course a great respect for Soros. So by Druckenmiller being such an amazing trading talent himself, his his feeling that Soros was not so much a mentor; he was already a very good trader by the time he joined, but somebody he could actually learn from and respect it as as a great talent. That itself is a, is the highest endorsement you could get. And oh, course, absolutely! You know, Soros has this record uh, of what he's achieved. Um, and, you know, an intellect as well, so. You know, one of the things, as I, as we work with a lot of new traders, Jack, and a lot of times when I meet a new trader that is just really off the, just right off the boat, learning how to trade, doesn't even know what a stock is, they focus so much on the technical and the analytical process of trading, trends, patterns, support, resistance, indicators, and so on and so forth. But one of the things in your book that really stands out to me, Jack, is the emotional discipline it takes to really be successful long term. Can you speak to the concept of emotional discipline and how and why it's so important? Sure. Um, I think that there's many misconceptions. Well, let's back up. There are many misconceptions about markets. Uh, and when I say misconceptions, I mean among the general audience and novice mm -hmm. traders not talking about professionals. And there's this, and I think, it, I think Hollywood is largely to blame because if you made a movie about real trading, it'd be like an Andy Warhol movie. It'd be really boring. You know? It would be extremely you know, boring. Be it's like, not Wall Street, right? Like this, the Empire State Building for eight hours, right? You'd see yeah, people exactly. sitting at the desk looking at the screen. So it doesn't make good TV or, or movies or whatever. So Hollywood, you know, trading is always this, this testosterone-filled thing with people screaming and yelling and all this turmoil. And the amazing thing is that it couldn't be further. It's just exactly the opposite. Yeah. Uh, you know, real trading is like the most boring thing you could ever see. Uh, there's a quote I used. I saw Alex Honnold, um, you know, the, 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 the world-famous free climber, when he was on 60 Minutes and being interviewed. And so he, for, for those of you who don't know, Honold or what he does. I mean, this is the guy who literally scales 3,000 foot sheer cliffs, sheer cliffs without any ropes or any protection. Wow. That's a crazy thing to do. I, 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 I could not do that, Jack. Huh? I it's couldn't amazing. do that. Yeah, and if you, in fact, this movie is pretty amazing. Uh, uh, it's extraordinary. I mean, not the same dude, but he has moves in there that are extremely, the film is just leap, you know, and hope when catch on a rock with like a fingertip. And this is without any protection, 1,500 feet up. So anyway, they, the Lara, I forget her last name, Lara from 60 Minutes, um, she asked them, do you, ever, do you ever get an adrenaline rush? And he looks at her like shocked, oh no. You know, like if, if, if I have an adrenaline rush, something is drastically wrong. Yeah, I'm falling down. Be, not, everything has to be slow and controlled. And that's the same, you know, I, I, I stopped my, you know, I hit the pause button, I went and grabbed my pad, backed it up, and I got the quote exactly. Because I said, I, I never heard a quote about trading. And it wasn't about trading, but I never heard a quote that was as appropriate about trading as his comment about free solo climbing. And, uh, and so I put that as kind of in a little book of Mark Rose's, I think the first, the first quote I have is that, that quote. Mm -hmm. And so to your question about emotions, that's what it is. You really don't want a lot of emotion. Good trading is all about getting emotion out of it. You don't want emotion. Emotion, almost invariably, emotion will be a negative. And the people who are successful or have been successful because they've been able to, to find a way of trading where 
they control where the emotion is not part of it. And how they do that is because they've got really good control of the risk. Mm -hmm. and so without that, of course, there would be a lot of them. That's so hard to overcome though. I mean, it, we're so emotional about money and making money and not losing money that we get so caught up in the financial aspect of the market when what you really should be focusing on is just the technical side of it. What is yeah. the trend? What is the pattern? What is the probability? What is the return versus the risk? It can be a lifelong journey, really kind of mastering the concept of mindset. What is, what is one recommendation or suggestion you could give our listeners to help them overcome the emotion of money and the emotion of trading? Yeah. So the important thing, does this come up in multiple interviews is no, Know what you can lose before you go into the trade. Um, be clear about that. Be clear about what you're willing to lose, uh, what you're risking on the trade. And ideally, uh, use, if, you're using, if you use stops uh, as, as a risk control me uh, measurement, uh, management the tool, mm -hmm. then actually put in a stop at the time you put in, you know, time you put in the trade. So the decision's already been made. So you don't have emotion because one thing that happens is the second you put on a trade the one thing you automatically lose is objectivity so if you can make your decision about where you're getting in that's that's the easy part but where you're getting out before you put the trade then you can pretty much get emotion out of it because you've already decided okay i'm going to get into the trade here i'm going to risk this amount and if it gets that amount i was wrong i'm out It'll cost me X dollars. I know that ahead of time. I'm willing to accept that. I'm willing to, to risk that amount because I think the trade's going to make Y dollars. So if you do that, then the emotion is, you take the emotion out of it mm -hmm. and uh, to a very large extent. I mean, you can always get out before that point, but at least you know what your worst case, what your worst Accept Except the risk, right? Yeah. And I think you that's- Utilize and accept the risk. Yeah, so I think if you are rigorous about setting your risk, before you enter trades, that can really be the most effective way of removing emotion. Out of everyone that you've interviewed for anything, wrote book, New Market Wizards, whatever, everything you've done in your career, is there any trader that has influenced your own philosophy to the market more than others? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, there've been a number, uh, like the rule we just talked about. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think. Maybe the first person in the interview to say it was Bruce Kovner, because that was in the first book. And maybe he wasn't the only one to say it, but he said it most clearly. And uh, I say it's probably, if I only had 10 words of advice to give traders, that would be as good as any 10 words I could pick. And is what we were talked about just a moment ago, which is know where you're gonna get out before you get in. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I think that was probably the most single most important concept. Uh, Overall, the idea that risk management is more important. There have been, in, there, but then there are there are one-off things like, for uh, so example, Marty Schwartz uh, had his own kind of thing where he said, uh, "If you ever were really worried about a market, uh, know where you're going to get out." Uh, not mm -hmm. I'm sorry, uh, do, and the market. If you're really worried about the market, let's say on a weekend, and it opens up Monday, and you're worried about you're going to get killed, and and you're not losing money. His advice was don't get out. Now, uh, I mean, the reason that works, by the way, is because you're really worried. There's good reason, you know, there's mm -hmm. some drastic news has come out counter to your position. The market is, you're short, the market is just broken out wildly to new highs. There's good reason for you to be scared, you know. And if, despite all of that, it doesn't go against you, more often than not, your position is probably right. And, and so, like, I think, when I talk about influence, I, I can remember, I don't know, six, seven years ago, but I remember one time I was building a short position in, in the stock indexes as it was getting towards the highs. And then basically just on a technical and, uh, mm -hmm. and I was maybe about 85% short and, a, and a, an unemployment report came out. I don't remember the exact report or whatever. All I know is it couldn't have been more negative for the market at the time. Mm -hmm. um, the market behaves differently to unemployment reports, you know, good and bad depending on the time, but in that particular yeah. time frame. That unemployment report was such that it was, and it was one of those reports, you know, usually they'll say, well, this number was bad, but this number, you know, is not so bad. 
this report, there was just nothing, nothing across the board. Across average the board, it was income, negative, unemployment, uniformly yeah. negative for the market. I'm mostly positioned short. Market starts selling off. It's a Friday. I figured, hey, you know, perfect trade. I'm good to go. And, and I'm yeah. saying, this is a trade where I'm scaling into a short. I'm going, and I don't do that. I don't sell into strength per se. I'll do that only if I'm, you know, because it's coming up to a resist. I have several points which suggest the resistance zone. And I'm willing to sell it in that zone and risk beyond it, essentially. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I'm blindly selling it to new highs. So it seemed like, hey, perfect, you know, I like sold right into the zone. It failed right. It's coming down. And then it stops and it starts going up. And it goes up and it goes up. And it finishes the day. I don't remember if it finished higher or finished close to unchanged. And that, I remember my son coming over, or one of my sons came over. Um, and at that time, he was working for... Uh, he was he was working for as an assistant trader in a mm -hmm. prop, prop prop trading company, and I remember telling him, you know, Zach, boy, you know, doesn't look good. Yeah, you know, I'm sure you know, I was talking about them in the trade. Anyway, Sunday night comes, and you know, I'm expecting it to open higher, and it opens lower. You know, the the uh, stock index is open lower, and I think of Schwartz. I honestly mm -hmm. think of Schwartz. I mean, otherwise I would have been out, right? And uh, I stay, and then it goes down and down, and then I just I, I had just to appease the gods. I didn't want to tempt the gods. I got out of the middle of it just to, just, just so, you know, but I kept the- Did, I kept did the you get out, did you I get out that Sunday night? Back, but I kept most of the position. And I strictly kept it because the first thing that came to my mind was that quote. So things like that, you know, come up all the time. And, uh, well, and, and speaking about that, when, when, I'm, when I'm reading the book, and I'm sure our listeners, when they're reading the book, there's certain common traits that stand out amongst these successful traders. What would you say are the two to three most successful traits that are commonality with these individuals? Okay, uh, the, I, I probably have 50 in my books, mm -hmm. but the most of the ones that come immediately to mind, one is risk management, discipline is second, I'm not in order right here. Yeah, yeah. And flexibility to change your, your opinion. Um, you know, as one trader said, you know, it's going higher, it's going higher, it's going higher, it's going lower. He said, that's the mindset of a trade. You know, you have to be able to switch on a dime if, if the facts dictate that. And you know, I was, I was uh, given an interview and I can't remember who I was talking to, Jack, but it was probably about three, four months ago. And we were talking about politics and they were, I, I, I enjoyed getting into the political discussions. And, you know, I was talking about how uh, politicians are flip floppers and they flip flop on anything. And I said, you guys might not understand this, but politicians are not the biggest flip-floppers. Traders are the biggest flip-floppers. We'll go from bullish to bearish in a second, right? You, you got to be flexible in your approach to the markets. And you can't, you, I think Jesse Livermore said it best in Reminiscence when he said, you can could, you could have your opinions all day long. And I'm obviously paraphrasing, but markets are never wrong. Your opinion certainly can be, you know, read the tell of the tape. And that's what the most important thing is. In terms of these these traders that that you've interviewed back in the '80s, in comparison to to now, are traders today better than they were 30 years ago? Well, some of the traders are the same trade. I'm actually working on a new market wizards book, so mm -hmm. yeah, I wanted to get your take on that. Yeah, so one of the traders, uh, you know, is 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 someone who was trading back, you know, in the '70s, so he's still trading. Uh, so in some cases, they're the same. And when I did Hedge Fund Market Wizards, one of the people I interviewed was Ed Thorpe, who started trading back in the 60s. So uh, some of the traders that I interview in later books really have been around for a long time. One, in, the, in the new book I'm working on, I've only done a few of the interviews, but like two of them are something completely different than I would have encountered ever before. And so like one example, uh, I'm not going to go into details here, but I've always thought the trader is, a fund is either fundamentally oriented or technically oriented or some combination of the two. Mm -hmm. I, I never even conceived of can't be anything else, right? It's got to be something. But yet one of the interviews I've done for this book, um, the trader, and I call it, the, I've, I know what the title is of that chapter. It's neither because he doesn't use fundamentals and he doesn't use technical. And <laughs> what is he as amazing as that sounds, yeah, I'm not going to give it away, but that's a true statement. So what he, and what I'll tell you, what he's doing could not have been done back in the 80s, mm -hmm. 
technology. So part of it is a, he, his technique could only have been possible in more recent times. Um, and, and I want to talk about that, Jack, because, you know, obviously over the last 30 years since you wrote The New Market Wizards in 1989, you know, the, the technology boom, the technological and information era has just exploded. And, you know, I first started trading back in 07 and 08, Jack, and, yeah, or 05 and 06, and, and really kind of started getting, you know, decent and good back in 07, 08, and 09. But, you know, it's, it's even in the last 10 years, the markets have evolved so much with algorithms and high frequency trading. In terms of the market from 89 to 2019, what are the most fundamental differences the market has, has changed in that course of that 30 years? Well, I think you put your, your finger on it is, is, is the computerization of trading. So we come, my early days in the, in, in the markets, um, we, you know, you're talking pre, pre, well, you had computers, you had mainframes basically, and, mm -hmm. and they weren't very powerful and uh, way before personal computers, right? So you come from that type of world in a type of world where somebody like Ed Sakota is talking about using an IBM 360 mainframe, which fills the size of a room, mm -hmm. to do trend following, you know, which you could do on the, on the most, on the least powerful PC you could probably buy in the market. Um, you know, and let alone to supercomputing computer power. It's, a, it's a, just extraordinary. I mean, it's, it's, it's like a different world. So that has been a big transition. So a lot of methodologies, that would have been impossible uh, years ago now become doable because of that that computer power. And then also, once you have that computer power, then you have certain mathematics that can be applied, which couldn't practically be applied before, like artificial intelligence, certain mm -hmm. certain types of artificial intelligence and big data, which require a lot of computing power. Um, you could have theoretically come maybe come up with with you. Could, Theoretically, you could have come up with the mathematics of that 50, 60 years ago, but it would have been no way to execute it. So, um, so those are the big, those are changes. So that means that you now have money being made in the markets in a different way that couldn't have been made before. And then you have certain techniques that were very effective in the 70s and 80s, such as trend following, mm -hmm. which are, which, and, and, why? Because remember, in, in the 70s, this was pre-computer days pretty much for everybody. So mm -hmm. the few people who were writing these programs and doing simple trend following were, were, were able to do very well. Makes me uh, think of Richard Dennis, the turtle trader story when you... Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, right, the turtles and all that. And yeah, they were, they were phenomenally successful in the 70s and 80s. Uh, not the turtles, but... Yeah, trend but, traders. But people like Dennis. Uh, and, uh, and then it really changed. And it changed because, because now too many, a lot of people are able to do the same thing. So certain, certain approaches have lost a lot of their efficacy, like trend. There are still trends, but the markets will do their damnedest to knock you out of the trend. You know, they, they just, they just. Do you think it. that's forced traders to really focus on shorter time frames from a trading perspective because of the, you know, the speed of the market? Probably shorter and longer. Anything, yeah, either one. Yeah, anything but in between, right? Yeah. Because if you've got enough uh, uh, enough gumption, if you if you could really, you know, you have to you have to be right about the long term. But and the losses are much larger if you're wrong. Uh, but long term trend now, I haven't done it recently. I do remember the days where I did look at the, you know, where, where I did do the analysis. It was even back in the even back in the 80s. Long term always did better than short term. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just return risk wise, it always did better. I suspect it's probably still true, uh, but all of, all of those approaches now are probably less, are, are, are less effective and can go through extended period, extended drawdowns larger than you would have gotten previously with the same approach. So you have, so you go back to your prior question, that's, you have new, 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 new methodologies in, also old methodologies out. You have certain things like completely gone, like the pits, right? Yeah. When I when I started out, it was all pit trading in futures. Now it's all electronic trading. So so, so things have changed in those respects. Ah, but I still think that there are certain inherent things about the market that haven't changed, because ultimately, even if a lot of it's being computer driven, the the programs don't. don't maybe at some point the programs will write to 
maybe computers will write the programs, but now basically humans are writing the programs. And uh, so human emotion still comes in, even if it's kind of one removed. And I, I wanted to talk about that, Jack, that's because when, when you, and it's at the very beginning of New Market Wizards, when you're talking about the things that you personally have learned from this, markets are not random, markets are not random because it's based on human behavior, there's no holy grails and so on and so forth. That, that point number two, markets are not random because it's based on human behavior, has that changed? I know humans still program the algorithms, but you know algorithms now speak to other algorithms and AI kind of takes over. Do you see that changing in the future where the market is removed from a human behavior perspective? Uh, I, I used to answer that as probably not for a very long time. Mm -hmm. But one thing that gives me a bit pause, I mean, I don't think we're there yet, but one thing that gives me a bit, pa a bit of pause is the, the rapidity of computer power, mm -hmm. how it's progressing. And, and not, not that I shouldn't say computer power, I should say also, artificial intelligence. The last decade's been absolutely insane with the evolution of technology. Yeah, so if you take something like, uh, you take something like uh, chess and blue and deep blue, the IBM computer, I believe, I'm not an expert here, but I believe that was, that was just pure power, pro, you know, just mm -hmm. pure processing power. Because uh, I mean, chess has an you know, enormous amount of, uh, of, of moves, but, and I guess with some, some programming to limit the, the, the selection somewhat, that processing power could take you there. But then you go to something uh, like Go, which, uh, which I don't know even how to play, but I do know that it's many, 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 many multitudes, uh, more, uh, more combinations than yeah. chess. It's way, way, it's too, even, even today's processing power, I don't think you go there. But with artificial intelligence, they, in recent, in the last couple of years, have actually come up with a program that can beat the best Go player. So that's kind of sobering. Um, now, does it concern one you? Thing, the one thing that still works in favor of humans having a role in the markets is unlike chess or unlike Go, where there are specific rules mm -hmm. and the rules never change. Um, to use uh, Jim Rogers' term, the markets are like this 10,000, the puzzle of 10,000 pieces. And they're always taking out some pieces and throwing in new pieces. There's always variables. Yeah. So the thing is, the the way the markets behave are always changing. So it may make it a problem that is even so far beyond the complexity of, of something even as as difficult as Go to solve for artificial intelligence. That maybe it still leaves a niche there for for humans. But today, I mean, I'm still finding traders who are basically, you know, really, really beating the market uh, mm -hmm. with numbers that are strong enough that, I mean, anything could be locked, but, but uh, probably not, you know? I mean, it's just, uh, there's a certain consistency there with enough people. So, uh, and it's a well-defined approach. Each one has one and they're doing it and it's working. So I think it's still possible. We haven't got, gotten to the point where, where humans can't win anymore. And if we ever do get to that point, I guess, the irony of that is that the efficient market hypothesis will finally be right. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that it, it finally is the efficient market theory. It might have just been a, it might have just been a century early. <laughs> That's funny right there, Jack. You know, in terms of the algorithms and, and, you know, AI and everything, in your opinion, does it make the markets more consistent from a short-term tra uh, trading perspective than it was even two, three decades ago? I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't know... Um, I, I don't know how it, other than, uh, other than introducing new ways of making money, I really, it's kind of difficult to say, and, and seeing that trends become much choppier. But other than that, I, I don't really know how it's changed the way the market behaves. You know, in, term, in terms, of, we're, we're talking about AI and algorithms and whatnot. What are some of those biggest obstacles that you see that the market is faced with over the course of the next few years? When you say the markets, what do you mean by the market? Like, like the, the stock market. What, what concerns you, I guess, is, is my question regarding the financial world. Yeah, one answer to the market's change, I think, well, right now we're seeing a very, very long, steady rise in the market, you know, stock market at least, right? 
Um, I don't think we, we've abolished the, the uh, bubbles and bursts, you know, panics uh, thing. So uh, I think that is still, you still have that situation where you can get markets having these very, very long sustained moves beyond, beyond true valuation and mm-hmm. then at some point have collapses. Uh, so uh, I think that still would, I still expect panics I don't think 2008 was a uh, was the last time we yeah. had that. I think uh, neither I think, do I. Yeah, we'll and, see. and Jack, that was kind of my uh, what I was trying to we'll ask. See. The obstacles. We'll and, see other 2008 yeah. because what happens is the longer these trends go, the more complacent people become, and uh, and the more complacent they become, the more danger there is uh, there is uh, of, of of having a market collapse at some point. It's sort of like a like uh, earthquake, you know, there's no mm-hmm. earthquake after 200 years, so people become complacent, you know, but uh, it doesn't mean, in fact, the longer it goes, the longer you go about an earthquake at a fault line, the more dangerous it is because there's more pent up power. So, um, but people don't look, look at it that way. They, they look at what's done best in the five year, past five years, past mm-hmm. 10 years. And, and the answer is always going to be the market that's been most overdone in a direction. So I'm not saying that the market's going to top out here or whatever. I have no idea. But I think at some point, uh, I mean, the market's in high valuation anyway. But at some point, you do reach a point where, and you have other problems that are being totally ignored, uh, which I have difficulty believing. What's that? Uh, debt deficits. Exactly. Slow and roll, the deficit, all that, yeah. exactly. And I do have trouble believing. I mean, I don't think the, the modern uh, the modern economic theory that the that deficits don't matter is right. I just can't, in my heart of hearts, I just can't believe that's true. I Jack, think I agree with you 100% on that. Yeah, I think 100%. Because we, we kind of print our own currency and right now we're, we're the safe haven, but you never know what's going to change the, the, you know, the market mentality. And, uh, and when it does, every, it's like the floodgates are open. So I think there are real dangers there. And uh, so that will cons- what concerns me most, I, what concerns me most probably is, is this complete disdain for the deficit. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, I think, I think oddly enough, uh, the right is more guilty than the left, uh, although they're both guilty. I blame them both. Yeah, because, uh, because yeah, you know, at least the left only say, you know, you, you, you know, you got to increase deficits, uh, Keynes, and Keynes not a left right, but Keynes never said increase deficits when there's an expansion going on. He, he said also that said to pay down debt. To count the recessions. I mean, Keynes would turn over in his grave at the way, you know, but of course people, the people pushing deficits now are not Keynesian, they're anti-Keynesian, but ironically, they, they, they're like Keynesian on, on, on uh, you know, steroids something like is, that. is like, what they're on, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's like just complete abandon. So I think the, the, the economic policies have become so reckless. And it's not like there's any hope because the Democrats aren't there saying, God, this is just day we can't do this. They're there saying, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't push the deficit because of uh, the cut taxes. Mm-hmm. We, sh- we should do deficits to do infrastructure. Well, at least there you get something of value but still, you have to deal with the problem. You can't just completely ignore uh, the, the size of the deficit, uh, especially in expansion of time. What do you do when it's a recession? Well, uh, yeah. and, and I want to get your take on this, Jack, because I read an interview you did a few years ago. I can't remember if it was 2014, 13, or 2012, but you, you basically, it was a very similar question, you know, what concerns you? And you talked about the deficit. And in the last six years, Jack, I mean, President Obama, a Republican Senate, President Trump, a Republican-controlled Congress, our deficits and our debt has been absolutely blown out of any economic, you know, conservative-type philosophy. And, and it doesn't seem like there's a political answer to this. If we continue to expand the deficit and the debt as we have over the last 10 years, what, where do we go from an economy? Are we, are we talking Japanese stagnation at that point? Uh, well, Japan is there. Japan's an up. I mean, I don't know how Japan resolves itself either. I mean, they're, they're they kill their currency eventually. Their <laughs> deficit is, is, is much worse uh, than ours, even. 
Um, what I'm afraid of, I mean, I don't know how it ends, but I kind of can't think of a scenario that ends well is mm -hmm. one what scares me. Uh, I just can't think of a scenario. At least, you know, at least previously, at least the, 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 de the deficit was coming down. It was we're still adding to the debt, but at least the, the amount we were adding every year was going down. Now we've gone to a situation where the amount we're adding every year is going up. And it's and we're we're at full employment, so you know so I think it's much worse than it was. Uh, it, it sounds like you're a you're a deficit hawk, a monetary hawk, you know, and those are the things that that concern me uh, concern me as well. In the last six months, there's been a lot of political pressure being put on the central bank, Jack, to start lowering interest rates to even spark even more of this insanity. But if we really do start lowering interest rates in, in, in the back half of 2019, how do you think the market would respond to that? Well, I mean, the market will go up. I mean, the market will go up because the market is looking, is looking for the immediate near term. And for the immediate near term, it'll make, we have, we used to have inflation going into, you know, inflation of goods and stuff like that. Now we have inflation going into assets. You mm -hmm. know, the last, the last, uh, the last financial meltdown we had, it was going into housing to a large extent and, and housing related. Now, you know, it's going into financial assets. So it's changes the type of assets is going. I mean, if, Inflation, it always goes somewhere, you know. It mm -hmm. either goes into goods and services or it goes into uh, housing or it goes into... So now we're going into financial assets. And now if you make it even more favorable for fin to hold financial assets by, by making it unfavorable to have any other, you know, to put in mm -hmm. you know, bonds or whatever, then you just increase prices even more. So I think the stock market would go up. Of course, the bond market, you know, uh, will react... Uh, you know, will react to the low, you know, will go up and, uh, but you have both in dangerous, you, you then have both in dangerous territory, one being very overvalued. And in the case of bonds, you're kind of hinging on everybody continuing to buy the story. And if they don't, then you run into a vicious cycle where if once interest rate starts going up, the deficit gets worse. And, and the more, you know, and the more you try to count to the deficit, the more interest rates go. You, you, so there are some horrible scenarios out there, and it seems like everybody's ignoring it because of political expediency. Well, so. Jack, I just feel it's completely insane after 10 years of price appreciation to, for us to even talk about, you know, stimulating the marketplace. It, it's, it's been stimulated <laughs> like because none other it's, market. It's political expediency and economic ignorance. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, or well, if I'm being kind, it's economic and, uh, uh, ignorance, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure. It's like either it's economic ignorance or political expediency. It's one or the other. It 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 could be political incompetence as well. I mean, it's just it's absolutely. No, it's I mean, politically no. Poli it's not political. You know, politically politically they're doing the right thing. If people react to incentives, unfortunately, mm -hmm. the way our our system has evolved is our political system is congressmen and senators, but especially congressmen running every two years, are incentivized to win the next election. Yeah. So they're not concerned, and they should be, but they're not concerned about 30 years out, 20 years out, 10 years they're out. They're concerned about the election cycle. They're concerned about the next election. And so, and, and the, the, you know, for presidents, the same thing, you know, they're concerned about the next election. So uh, I think that's the problem. The problem is the short-term focus. Now, it does make political sense if you, you know, uh, as much as I disagree with Trump on just about everything, mm -hmm. uh, especially economics, um, he but for political expedient, he's doing the right. He's he's got he's doing the right thing to maximize his his incentive is to get reelected, to get reelected if he can push interest rates down, mm -hmm. if he can jawbone the Fed into following his his instructions, then that will push the market higher. Will probably even you know make the economy stronger short term. Short term, but we're trading some additional short term sugar highs for a lot of problems later on. So you know, it, he's, it, he's doing the right thing politically to get reelected. Well, I, I, I said this just the other week, Jack, that the only way he doesn't get reelected, in my opinion, if the economy starts faltering and the stock market comes down and 
every policy from a monetary and a fiscal perspective we're seeing coming out of Congress or the White House is to push that type of an uh, type of an agenda. And you know, as somebody who is, you know, I'm not a Trump guy in any capacity. I'm kind of like you in that. I, I don't agree with his approach economically. And that's kind of one of the number one voting things that I personally take into account when I'm voting for the president. Uh, but at the end of the day, we can't control that. We have to trade the price action and leave the political, the, the political situations out there. But that can be much harder, harder. It's easier to say that than it is to do it, correct? How do you how do you go about this with your wealth of experience, Jack? How do you go about removing all of the noise and just focusing on what you need to do as a trader? Well, as a trader, you've got to uh, actually one of my you've really got to ignore you got to ignore what you want. In fact, I forget who said it. But somebody says, so I think one of the quotes somewhere in one of the books was, uh, "You have to do what you know the market will do, not what you hope it will do." You know, mm -hmm. something along that line. I'm paraphrasing here, um, and it's the same thing. If you're talking now, we're going back to trading. From a trading perspective, you have to ignore what you want and what you think is good, or, or anything else. You just have to focus on what you think, based whatever your approach is, the market's going to do. And I can think. This is still pains me to think about this, but one of the things I, I realized at the time and I did absolutely nothing was on the last election where, you know, it was a complete surprise that Trump won. Mm -hmm. and initially, the market starts selling off like it, like you. People don't realize that because it was on the overnight, it but it did. The market starts selling off sharply like you expect, and all of a sudden it starts rallying sharply. I kind of knew that's the classic, that's the classic example of where the market is, you know, you, 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 you sell the rumor, buy the news or whatever. Yep. And, and so that, that price action and, it was, and the fact that it was acting so completely opposite to expectations was, I, I kind of knew it was a great signal, but I just couldn't bring myself. I was so disappointed with the outcome that I let that crowd. I missed out on the entire yeah, run in November, Jack, of 2016. Like literally, the the and I was I was trading the futures market that night during the election, and I was so surprised by the outcome of the election that and and, and I I had this opinion and and you know we should leave our opinions out of out yeah, of our yeah yeah that's what I'm saying so yeah. I, I had this opinion that if Trump was elected, he represents a little bit of a shock to the market. He represents a little uncertainty to the market that I didn't know how the market would respond, right? And so I missed out on that 10% price movement that happened from November 9th through, through mid-December. And, and like I said, you just got to work on removing that emotion from the equation. And that certainly can be a lifelong uh, journey here. Jack, I got a few more questions with you, if, if, if you don't mind. No, sure. A, a couple of them very quickly just goes to kind of your own personal process here. You're starting a new book, the, the next series of the New Market Wizards, correct? Right. When, when is that out? Well, what do you, what do you think? I've only done three of the interviews so far, and I'm writing those up before I do more interviews. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also, you know, I've got this fun cedar uh, uh, venture. And I definitely want to talk to you about fun yeah. cedar as well. So I've got that. So, I'm, you know, nothing is full time here. But I, so I figure I will probably get the book done, hopefully quarter one of next year. Mm -hmm. And in, when you're going into that, I'm sure there's a tremendous amount of time and effort and, and research and work that goes into that. Does your trading, how do you go about adjusting your trading, your investing? Do you make any modifications when you're in like research and writing mode? Yeah, I, I don't trade. <laughs> so <laughs> I, 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 I thought yeah. so, but I didn't want to ask. I, you know, I stopped trading a number of months ago because uh, I just didn't want to. I just don't want the distract, distraction. Also, I don't trade all the time. I just trade. I trade when I want to, when I'm in the mood, or or have time, extra time, or feel like it. That I just always go, and I've never considered myself a trader. It's just just another hobby or whatever that mm -hmm. I do sometimes and don't do other times. But I do know enough that if I'm busy, I got too many things going on, I don't want the, uh, I don't want the uh, distraction. And, and also, Jack, I've heard good, that you're it's also much. not good for trading. And I found, I always think of something that Ed Sakota said, which I found incredulous uh, when, I, when he first said it. And I just, he can't, almost my attitude was, you can't be serious. And he said, everybody gets what they want out of the markets. And I said, you mean 
they lose. And he said, everybody gets what they want out of markets. And I've since discovered that that's basically, for myself, that's basically true because when I don't want to be trading, you know, oh, I have too many things, but I have things going on. I have other reasons I don't want to be trading. I'll make money and then I'll blow it all on doing something stupid. You know, it's like, I just learned that if, if I know I shouldn't be trading, I'm better off not trading. So that's you know, the way I handle it. Jack, one of the things you talk about in your books is the, the importance of being humble as a trader, right? And uh, you are just extremely humble as a trader because I've heard you are a much better trader than you give yourself credit for. No, I'm not. I'm not. I, I, I mean, the, all I can say is I'd be a horrible trader if I hadn't experience, didn't have the experience of the books. And at least I'm that profitable. <laughs> so <laughs> it's as much credit as I'll give me. But I'm always, I always tell people I'm not a trader. I'm more of, a, you know, more of a, an analyst, a writer, an editor. Mm -hmm. Actually, the Marco Wizard books are more about editing than writing, uh, or they're both, but the editing is very critical. Uh, they're more about editing than interviewing, let me put it that mm -hmm. way. Uh, so I've got other skills I think I have, but trading is not, you ask me what my skills are, I guarantee you that trading would not be on that list. Okay. I got, I got four quick rapid fire questions for you, okay? Number one, outside of your own books, what is your favorite trading book? Well, you know, trading book. Well, I mentioned Reminiscences is a good book. Um, I, I think uh, I think a good book just for its basic philosophy and understanding is Nassim Taleb's uh, Fool by Randomness. Now, all of his books are worthwhile. Mm -hmm. that's, I don't think that's his own personal favorite, but that's the one I think, you know, for me, that's the one I think. The message of that book, I think, is, is important for people to understand. Um, I should say, preface say, I don't read really trading books per se. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's yeah, kind of... Well, a lot of the best trading books out there are more mindset driven, kind of like New Market Wizards, you know, Reminiscence, uh, those types of great books. Another question for you very quickly. New traders, new investors, they want to get into the market. What's one piece of advice you would give a new trader that's fresh off the boat? Okay. So maybe the most important advice is when you do start trading, trade with less than you want to, uh, mm -hmm. because odds are as a new trader, you're going to lose. You might as well get the experience at a cheaper tuition cost. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say, figure out what your methodology is before you actually start trading. And I know paper trading is not the same as real trading. It, it isn't, but still, I think it's a good idea for people to develop figure out what their methodology is, try it in paper trading, get some feel for it before they commit any real money. When they commit real money, have it be a smaller sum. One thing I've done, uh, even though I don't consider, I'm not a very good trader, but one thing I've done that's smart in my trading career when I do trade is I always, whenever I go back to trading, I start with a small amount of money. And, or I shouldn't say this, I, I have a mental stop point on how much I'm willing to risk. And it could be very, really very small amount. So if I start trading and I lose that amount, I walk away. That's it. So then I, at least it tells me that anytime I start trading, it's never going to cost me very much. I may give, my biggest sins have been giving away profits I've made. Mm -hmm. They've at least for, for a long, long time, they've never been losing money from when I start. Because I'm really, one thing I do correctly in my mind is that I do control the risk very tightly for my stake. So I think for beginners too, it's a good idea. Just limit a small amount. If you lose it, that means you weren't, something was wrong with your approach. Take, it's not the, or, or your approach could be fine, but it's just not the right timing. Take a break, rethink things, come back when you're ready and, and risk another small stake. So that's, that's another piece of advice I would give, which for me has personally worked well. It means that I've, I know I can never lose much in the markets mm -hmm. because if I, if I start out losing, I've lost a little amount. No, I love it, Jack. Two, two, two last questions very quickly. In New Market Wizards, in, in the eight things you list that you learned, to excel in trading, it takes talent and hard work. Okay, you talk about you can go buy a $300 system, a $3,000 system, but if you don't understand the question, you're not going to be successful. When you, when you, when you said that, what is the question that you're, that you're referencing? Um. I mean, knowing what your, what your approach is, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if 
I had the exact quote, I, if you had the exact quote, I might be able to tell you what I was thinking of. Yeah, I, I, I was but paraphrasing. I think, well, I think maybe maybe way to rephrase it is, uh, is uh, I think it's more a matter, I think it comes more into the guys that people who are trying to get somebody else to, to show them how to, how to show them the trading mm -hmm. approach, you know, to, to hand them a trading approach on, on, in a recipe book. They haven't, when I say, I think in that, that's, that's the context I've used this. Those people have not yet learned to ask the right question mm -hmm. because it's never, almost never, I shouldn't say never, because nothing is never. I've discovered exceptions to every rule I thought existed in certain people I interviewed, but almost, almost without exception, the people who are successful, they may have had some people they learned things from, they may have adapted some things from other traders, they may have had other traders give them a start and then they developed their own methodologies or whatever, but almost to a trader, they developed their own approach. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the context of that, haven't learned a question, uh, comment, I think I use it in the context of people who are asking for you to give them the answer on a silver tray, yeah. rather than trying to discover the, the answer. And that doesn't exist, obviously. Because, because it's different for every person. It's just not, you know, you could, you could show, a, a very successful trader could show another uh, wannabe trader their approach, and uh, they'll still lose money, because they won't have the same confidence. They won't have the same feel for it. So you have to, you have to know that it's not a matter of getting somebody to give you the answer. It's a matter of you trying to discover the answer on your own. And it's you going know, to be good for every person. You know, the way I interpreted the first time I read your book, Jack, was kind of what you talked about. You know, you, you asking the relevant questions, going through the process. And as I was kind of preparing for this interview, I was just thinking about it, my own personal journey and, you know, the evolution that I had. And, and the question really kind of, it reminded me a little bit of that great book by Simon Sinek, Start With Why, is that, well, why do you want to trade in the first place, right? What is, what is your why? And it can't be about money. It shouldn't be about, I want to get rich and I want to make money. Right. There's got to be something else beyond that, Jack. The last question I have for you is regarding to Fun Seeker. Uh, you're one of the uh, co-founders of uh, FunSeeker.com. FunSeeker. Yeah, FunSeeker. With a D. Fun, fun Seeder. Okay. Seeder, yeah. Oh, like Seed Capital. Seed, yeah. Seeder. Uh, fun Seeder. Yeah. I love the concept, Jack, but I want you to kind of explain what the concept is and why you started Fun Seeder. Yeah, so it wasn't my original idea to give credit, you know, credit where it's due. Uh, my, the CEO and, and the other co-founder, Emmanuel Bellari is the one who pitched the idea to me. And at the time I was working, acting as a consultant to a fund for, for the company he was with. And we were at a conference and we were talking and he pitched this idea. And the idea was to create a central website which would, which would find undiscovered trading talent world, worldwide and connect it with investors looking for new trading talent. Mm -hmm. the, the idea was that We've evolved into a financial world where the largest hedge funds manage an ungodly amount of the total assets. And then you have a second tier of funds which pick up the rest of the crops. And you can have talented people out there if they're in the wrong country, if they didn't go to Princeton or whatever, yeah. no matter how good they are, they won't, no matter how many emails are sent out, they'll never get looked at. They'll never have a chance to manage assets. You, you can have the Albert Einstein of trading somewhere in, uh, in, um, in Eastern Europe, maybe, and they'll never get discovered because they just don't have access to the capital. Yeah. So the idea was to create a site where people could have their account, link it, so the account's coming, the data's coming from the broker, so they, they get a verified track record. Now, they get all the analytics on that. You know, that's the enticement, is they get the analytics, the graphics on their account, uh, they can even do technical analysis uh, on their equity curve, stuff like that. So that's, that's the enticement to, to link in. Also the possibility of getting discovered for those who, who want that. So you create that on one side, and then you find people that would not, you would not have ever discovered any other way. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would never have had a chance to, to succeed any other way. Sort of democratizing the asset management world. So if we've worked on the, the tech, technology side and the trader platform, and this is the first year we're now beginning to focus on the 
on the investment side. So if we're planning to do uh, through the through a separate company for regulatory reasons called Fund Center Investments, to const we have an index that's been going in real time for almost four years, which has done well, which is based on you know uh, a hindsight free selection of traders in, in the database. And so that that could ultimately be an investable product. That's our plan. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at uh, seeding, finding investors who want to seed it's promising traders, and so that's another avenue. So that's the basic idea: is to act as the connecting link for traders trying to break into the asset match world who have the edge and skill, but not the connections or mm -hmm. anything else. And on the other hand bringing it to investors uh, or investors that are looking for a product that taps into a different source of, of uh, management skill. You know, I, I, when I, when I first read about your project, uh, fun, uh, the, uh, the, it's fun Cedar. When I first read about it, the first thing I thought about amazing concept, amazing idea. I've traveled the world, Jack, as an educator, teaching people how to invest and trade and, the basic concepts of technical and fundamental and behavioral analysis and so on and so forth. And I'm telling you right now, there is some great traders out there that would never be found, never be, never identify, never yeah. get that opportunity if it wasn't for people like yourself. Yeah. And if you know some, not only directed the fund seater, but also I'm going to use that uh, as a tool to find some of the traders. Up, That's uh, awesome. This book. So, if you know some undiscovered great trading talent, I'm interested. Let me know. Will do, Jack. Will do, Jack. Jack, we're going to have to bring you back on the podcast when uh, when you release your new Market Wizards book uh, next year. Sure. So, it, Jack, this has been so awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the Trading Justice Podcast. Our listeners are going to absolutely love this interview, and we'll be, we'll be more than happy to bring you on again to talk about that next book when you release it. Jack, well, enjoy thank you so much. Thank you. All right. We'll be right back with more uh, with more of the Train Justice podcast after this.